A, uh, sometimes themselves have a hard time coming to that conclusion because they were trained to think as Darwinists. And B, even if they do come to that conclusion, they're going to be very careful how they put their results in a scientific paper because they realize that most of, the, of their scientific peers are not ready to swallow um, a challenge to the whole paradigm. Uh, but in fact, if you look carefully at results, there are a number of results that very clearly challenge the basic premises of Darwinism, and they're out there. A paper written by Durrett and Schmidt that appeared in Genetics just a few months ago, and these are mathematicians, and they were asking the question, um, how long would it take for a two-step uh, mutation to occur in complex organisms like fruit flies they examined and they examined human beings. And the, the two steps that they were looking at are point mutations that um, first inactivate a binding site that controls how a gene is expressed and then create a new binding site in its place. So it basically converts um, gene regulation from one type to another. It doesn't actually change the gene. So if you view that sort of change in terms of the whole process that Darwinism is trying to explain, it's a very trivial change. It doesn't explain how you would convert one type of organism to another. Um, and the startling thing is they found that even for that kind of change, enormous amounts of time are required. For humans, they found that it would, it would require over 100 million years to accomplish that kind of two-step, two-point mutation change. Uh, when you consider the, that the history of primates is about 55 million years, it's hugely problematic when you come up with a figure of over 100 million years. It means it's not going to happen. Even that kind of trivial change is not going to happen. In fruit flies, you would expect that the situation would look better because fruit flies have a much shorter generation time and there's a lot more of them there. The population sizes are much larger. And indeed, Dirt and Schmidt suggested they went through their math and they suggested that it would take only a few million years for that kind of two-step change to happen in fruit flies. But one of their assumptions to come to that figure was that the first mutation, the one that knocks out the original binding site, caused no harm to the fruit flies so that they're able to accept the second mutation which causes an advantage, a fitness advantage. If you take a more realistic assumption that the first change is somewhat harmful, even mildly harmful, and you plug in the numbers to their math, you find that, again, the time scale blows up to several hundred million years, even for a change of this scale in fruit flies. So the overall picture is one where even very minor changes take an enormous amount of time by the Darwinian mechanism. People have given up on the idea that you can actually monkey with genes and make new genes. It's just not going to happen. So the big hope is that by flicking a few switches, you could turn, you know, a fruit fly into a butterfly. But there's no scientific evidence whatsoever that you could do that. It, it stands to reason that if you could do it, it would require a lot of these switches to be flicked because a butterfly is nothing like a fruit fly. And it also stands to reason that you would have a lot of very, very sick creatures in the middle of this process of flicking your switches because it's just not plausible to make that kind of change and confer an advantage, a fitness advantage, all along the way. So it, it just doesn't work. But that's why they're looking at switches instead of um, crafting genes because everyone can see that crafting genes is much, much harder. I think there is an interesting, there was an interesting point where there was a scientific finding that seemed to, it really excited people about Darwinism and that's when the modern synthesis came about with the, with the discovery of genetics, that, that genes are inherited. So it gave what, what for Darwin was just a hypothetical thing, that there are these things that get inherited that um, provide traits, the discovery, uh, Mendel's work on, on peas and, and breeding, the discovery that there are genes that get passed that do confer phenotypes excited everyone because now there was something demonstrated that had the, um, 
that was inherited in a way that Darwin assumed was possible, but he had no, he, there was nothing he could put his finger on to say, this is the thing that gets inherited. So, but that was in the early 20th century. It's much later that people started to realize how complicated these things are, how large genes are, how, um, how large genomes are, how much information you need to encode a single new protein fold. These things are, you know, in, in recent decades, these things have become increasingly clear, and this is where it swung very much the other way against Darwin's theory. The great quote of his is, if anyone could find, I, I won't try to butcher it, but if anyone could find anything that could not be had through a number of slight successive modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Well, that condition has been met time and time again now. Basically every gene, every new protein fold, there is nothing of significance that we can show can be had in that gradualistic way. It's, it's all a mirage. None of it happens that way. But clearly, if you believe that everything was cobbled together through random processes, then there would be a lot of junk. There would be the residue of cobbling sitting there, and that's why people jumped to this um, junk DNA hypothesis. They found out that a very small fraction of the genome actually encodes proteins. That was the one aspect of genomes that we understood well, is that they encode proteins, so they assumed all the rest of it um, is junk. Well, the truth is, we didn't know what the rest of it was doing, but that doesn't mean it's junk, and it's becoming increasingly clear that in fact it isn't junk, and that's a significant um, prediction is not a prediction that Darwin himself made, but it follows very readily and naturally from Darwinism, and it turns out not to be correct, and we're, that's becoming increasingly clear. In Darwin's day, we knew very little about cellular chemistry, for one thing. We knew very little about metabolism, how cells go about making the chemicals that they need to make the big, the big parts of, of living cells. Uh, we now understand that in, in some detail, and we also understand about the proteins that do the chemistry of life. These are called enzymes. We understand how large these enzymes are. We understand that they are encoded by genes, and we understand how that encoding takes place. That's called the, the genetic code. So really, uh, you put all that together, we now understand something about digitally encoded information in cells, encoded in the genome, we understand why it's there to encode proteins, and we understand how the proteins function to do the chemistry of life. And we also have the ability to measure, to some degree, how much information is there. If you put all that together, we now see something that looks very much like um, human designs, where we use digitally encoded information to accomplish things, and we know that it's impossible to get information at, on that scale through a chance uh, process that, that Darwinism employed.